Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I'm sure you're aware that the Bible presents the New Testament Christian in several different uh, types or several different ways. Uh, Christians presented as a farmer. Present, a Christian is presented as an athlete. But here I'd like to focus this morning on the aspect of the Christian being presented as a soldier. The Christian is presented as a soldier. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, we'll begin in verse number 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. So we have this idea of a soldier being presented as a Christian, is presented as a soldier, and he told Timothy here to endure hardness as a good soldier. We know in 1 Timothy chapter 1 we are told to war a good warfare, and we are told to fight the good fight of faith. He called Epaphroditus and Archippus over in Philippians fellow soldiers. And then he said about himself, Paul did before he died, he said, I have fought a good fight. So he had that mindset as he got up every day and as he went about his Christian life that he was engaged in a battle. He was engaged in a war. So consequently, we'll see throughout Paul's epistles how he highlights different aspects of of the Christian life as it being a battlefield and a, a war. And sometimes we don't see that, but I'm sure many of us, and think about your own life, some of the struggles you've gone through, it's been more than just playing paper, rock, scissors. It's been a battle. It's been an emotional battle, a spiritual battle, and you get done and you go through some trial in your life and you feel like you have fought something or you fought somebody. And the reason is you are in a spiritual battle. And so the idea that I want to really focus on this morning is the idea and the theme of battlefield dangers. The old song says, it's a battlefield brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. As Christians, we are engaged in warfare. And there's a lot of dangers on the battle. You know, there are real casualties. There are Christians who become casualties on the battlefield. They get out of the race. They stop. And before you point the finger and say, I can't believe they quit. I never would quit. You're not in their shoes. So let's have a little grace and a little patience. Consider thyself, the Bible says in Galatians 6, lest thou also be tempted. There are real casualties. There are people that get hurt. There are people that get wounded on the battlefield. And the old idea in, in battle was you, you shoot a soldier and you wound him and you really take out two soldiers because one's got to carry him off the battlefield. So a lot of times wounds can do a lot of damage. And so I want us to kind of visit this idea this morning. Uh, back during the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, the, um, the media, along with the Army and, and uh, United States forces, they, they pushed the idea of what they called embedded reporters. In other words, to bring the battlefield up close and personal. And they had these embedded reporters to go along with different troops and so forth to take footage, to capture stories and different things that they would bring back to the American people. And of course, there was a disadvantage of that, and one of the generals pointed this out. He said, the closer you are to the battle, the less you can see the whole war. So you're engaged in one little battle, one little problem, one, one little particular in your life, and that's what you focus on, and it's hard to be able to back up and see the perspective of the panoramic view of what's really going on. Thankfully, we have a Bible that helps us to see that. 
And so when, we, when we're engaged in our battle, we have to realize there's some dangers. There's some things taking place behind the scenes maybe or some things taking place over the next rise. There's some battles in the distance. You can ver barely faintly hear the bombardment and the, and, the, and the mortar and the shells. You can hear that faintly in the distance. You have no idea what's going on. Maybe there's some things right around the horizon that we're going to be taken aback and be taken by shock to see. And so the Lord gives us some warnings here. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first thing I want us to see is that there's a danger of being entangled here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at it. We obviously are in a war, but he makes this statement here in verse number 3. Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. So there's a danger of being entangled uh, to, to get in a trap, to get into a snare. And obviously the enemy will set up traps and snares and you read and you listen to stories about men in combat and especially in the jungles and all the things they had to deal with, not just the natural terrains. A good night, you can go especially now. You have all the kudzu growing, all the wisteria vines growing, all the wild grape vines growing. Don't you just love wild wisteria vines? Oh, they're so pretty. Yeah, give you a headache because of the allergies. And then number two, you can't cut the stuff down. It just keeps growing. I've seen it this big around. I've seen it this big around. You say, you're crazy. No, I'm telling you, I have seen some huge, I got some back in my yard this big around. You watch that wisteria, how that stuff grows and it entangles. That's just natural surrounding. That's natural stuff. When we start talking about the devil and what he's able to do in the spiritual world, and when you pull back the curtain and you begin to see the things that are going on there, there's some dangers to avoid. And he says here, no man that warreth entangleth himself. Now this is very interesting because this implies that a lot of soldiers get into trouble not because of the enemy and what the enemy is doing, although the enemy has set these things up, he has fallen prey to what the enemy has set up. There's all kind of traps and snares out there the devil has waiting for you. He has manipulated the world system to his own ideals. The Bible calls Satan the god of this world. And so he has a lot of snares, a lot of traps out there but here in the text, he says the danger is not that the enemy is going to ensnare you. The danger is that you can possibly allow yourself to be ensnared. Amen. The danger of being entangled. So how do you avoid it? Verse number one, I think we have to have the soldier's strength. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I, I've given you my advice. You can take it or leave it, but I think it's some good biblical counsel. Watch as less news as you can because it will drive you batty. And it will get you all in a frenzy and all worked up. Uh, you say, why? Because news is all about money. Don't you realize that everything is driven by money? The Bible still says in the King James Bible, the love of money is the root of all evil. If somebody will lie to you about very small, simple things. Yeah, this, this lawnmower works. Sure it does. And then you buy it and it doesn't work. Or the, the used car salesman, he never tells a lie. <laughs> you know, the people you work with and they say they're taking a 10-minute break and they come back 30, they never, they never tell lies or they never. So to think that in other places of our society, people are not lying and perverting and twisting the truth. You have to be real careful. So... There has to be a strength for the soldier not to be entangled. Psalm 144, 1, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. How does the soldier fight? Where does he get his strength? His strength comes from within, but it comes as a Christian. It comes from the Lord. Amen. Ephesians 1, 19, What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. God's power can work inside of you. And so the idea here is that the soldier is strong because of the strength that God gives him. How can you avoid entanglements of the world? Number one, <laughs> don't fall prey to its allurements. I know you think you have to have the latest and greatest gadget and social media 
and technological stuff that's out there, but that is a trap and a snare. And it will pull you in. Well, I just want to keep up with my family. Some of your family aren't worth keeping up with. <laughs> Blood's thicker than water. I understand that. However, a lot of times what happens is you get caught up in, you drown in the drama. And you invite the trouble. It's like, I'm going to watch, you know, a little bit of this news. Two hours later, you know, you're biting, you have no fingernails left. So the soldier has to go on God's strength. You know what? You have an off button on those things. David, when he came to the Goliath, the giant in his life, and no matter what spiritual battle you're engaged in, and all of us are engaged in spiritual warfare, it's a giant, and you think, there's no way I can beat this giant. Well, here's the other way to look at it. There's no way that giant can beat God. David said, you come to me with swords and staves. I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. You know, as Christians, we're, su we're supposed to be soldiers. I'm glad we have some men in this church. I like that. You know, I, you go to a lot of churches, it's kind of has an effeminate feel to it. You know, the song leader gets up there and he's all effeminate most of the time. I'm not saying, you know, I, but a lot of the times, you know what I'm talking about. You've been to them, some of these churches, and it's just got nothing wrong. Ladies, you're supposed to be effeminate. Amen. Girls ought to look like girls, and men ought to look like men. Amen. <laughs> I like singing hymns, not hers. Amen. But the idea of being a Christian soldier, you don't have to be a weakling. You don't have to check out your masculinity as men because now you're followers of Jesus Christ. The idea of being meek is weak is not a biblical idea at all. There was this uh, trucker and he's driving through and thank God for truck drivers who are putting the food on the shelves still, amen? Uh, but you got the trucker and he comes through it's late at night and comes through a truck stop and uh, gets out to get him something to eat and goes in a little cafeteria there and he's got his food there and then not too long after he got his food, there was about four or five motorcycle guys come in, look pretty rough, you know, like they were part of one of Spurgeon's old gangs there, you know. And they come in and they walk over there to the motorcycle guy, I mean, to the truck driver, and they take his plate and they just tip it over. They take his tea and they just pour it into his lap. And that truck driver sitting there, you know, looking down there, looks up at those guys, says nothing. Gets up, goes, pays his, his meal, and leaves. And the waitress comes over there, you know, and she's taking the order of the uh, motorcycle guys, and the, those, those, they're laughing, still getting a kick out of it, you know. They just push that guy over, you know. He just, and, they, and they said to the waitress, they said, that guy, he wasn't much of a man, was he? She says, no, he's not much of a truck driver either. He just drove over four motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> just because you're, you're meek, you don't have to be weak, amen. Now, the soldier not only has strength in verse number 1, but notice, very essential, verse number 4, he has separation. There's a decision that has to be made, and it comes from God's strength. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. There are some things, as a Christian, you simply have to withdraw from. And it takes God's strength to be able to separate. There's a thing called... Uh, secondary separation, they call it, or superficial separation, where people get this form of religion. They think, well, if I always wear a nice shirt and tie, or if I always wear a dress, or if I always uh, act a certain way, or do something outwardly, that means I am a great Christian. That's not necessarily right, because there are a lot of religious groups that don't have the right doctrine that do things outwardly. There's a separation that has to take place inwardly where you draw nigh to God. And the opposite of that is if you separate to God, you have to separate from things. The best way to get the outside cleaned up is to get the inside cleaned up. Remember John the Baptist, he said, he must increase, I must decrease. Notice the order of that. The order is that Jesus Christ increases first and then we decrease. It's not, okay, I've got to decrease, I've got to do all these things, get myself all in order so then I can be such and such. No, then you will start worshiping yourself. 
You've got to put him first. And that separation comes from the strength and power of God. Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 6. Not only do we war, but we wrestle. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter 6. There's a danger of being in, ensnared and entangled, but we wrestle. Ephesians chapter number 6, there's a danger of being imprudent. I'll show you what I mean by that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a danger of being imprudent. You can be deceived about who you're actually fighting here. Notice that the enemy is concealed in verse number 11. He says, the wiles of the devil. In other words, he's very sly. Remember when the Bible introduces Satan in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, like a snake. You know, sometimes those snakes, they blend into the environment. You can't hardly even see them. They sit so still, and they just kind of slither through. Sneaky snake slither. <laughs> Subtle sneaky snakes. They're sly. And they slither through the grass and sneak up on you. And the danger in the warfare oftentimes is we see flesh and blood, which is the physical manifestation of the spiritual problem. And we think the enemy's in front of us, but the enemy's really behind that. And so the danger is that the enemy can be concealed. So you have to ask your question, who's behind that? Or what's behind that? Remember when Jeroboam set up those two calves in Israel, he put one in Dan and one in Bethel. And he had those calves set up and he instituted priests and he tried to mimic the order that God had set up for the southern tribes. But the idea, whenever you read later on, is that God says they were worshiping devils. Now if you were to look at those golden calves, it's just... Stuff that people have made. They carve it up and they cover it in gold and it's nothing. You could go up and knock it down. But the idea is what's behind that. So that's no big deal, you know, that people have idols and images. What's behind those idols and images? I don't want to bust your bubble, but if you wear a cross around your neck, that's not going to give you any protection. You think a vampire walks in the room, you can hold it up. <laughs> What's behind that? Somebody could take my Bible and they could rip it to shreds and burn it right in front of me. And you say, what are you going to do, beat them up? No. I'd try to witness to them and pray for them. Because if I tried to, and I've had a guy take my Bible one time and threw it right on the ground in front of me. It took all I had in me not to knock his block off. But I would have ruined everything this book stood for if I got in a fight with flesh and blood. Babies do that kind of stuff. A little two-year-old comes up and hits you on the leg. You don't haul off and sock them. It's okay, let's fight. Let's talk. No, you're an adult. You see this little baby just acting like a baby, or you see this, let me bring it into the modern age, you see these unsaved people with no hope in this world, with no truth, living in a delusion, believing a lie, buying into hate, buying into deception. What are you going to do? Pull out your gun and shoot them? <laughs> no, you're going to pray for them. And you're going to engage in spiritual warfare because you know who's behind that. We are Christians. And as Christians, we have to realize we have a higher calling. I'm not called as a Christian to try to defend liberty and freedom worldwide. That's not my calling. There are Christians in communist countries and socialist countries that have to submit and have been submitting under non-freedom regulations for their entire lives. My calling is not to try to go over there and 
destroy those political leaders or to try to set up some type of freedom culture over there. Our calling as Christians is to worship God in spirit and in truth. And sometimes the enemy gets concealed and we can't see what's going on. We have to ask who's behind that. You remember when Delilah got into her tricks with Samson? And Delilah, you know, he fell in love for her because the Bible says there was a woman in the valley of Sorek that he loved, okay? He didn't say he loved the harlots and all the other women problems that he had, even his wife, but it said he loved this woman. And it took a while for her to ensnare him, but she had made an agreement with the lords of the Philistines. So who was really behind her, the lords of the Philistines? Who was really behind the lords of the Philistines? The false gods. Who's behind the false gods? The devil. So here's Samson in the lap of Delilah, and he's laying in the lap of the devil himself, and he doesn't even realize it. Because when we get into that war, it's, there's a danger that we can't see what's really behind it. Enemy is concealed, but notice in verse number 12, the enemy is revealed. Ladies and gentlemen, you have God's revelation in your lap, and this book will reveal the enemy to you. In Job 41, when it talks about the devil, he says, I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. God shows you who the enemy is, and thank God he shows us where the enemy is going to go. Somebody said, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen. And so we understand who the enemy is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we have to understand that we have a high calling in Jesus Christ to realize the battle that we are in instead of getting off track and fighting the wrong battle. Josiah, the great king in the Old Testament, he did a lot of good things as a young man. Josiah made some decisions to follow God even though previous kings did not do that. And he actually brought some type of reformation to the uh, kingdom of Judah. But when he got older, he was just anxious for a fight. And you can read it back in Chronicles, but he even, he wanted to fight with the king of Egypt. The king of Egypt was just passing through with an entourage there, and he came out, and he's like, look, Josiah, I'm not, don't meddle with what God's doing. I'm not fighting you. And Josiah wanted to fight with the king of Egypt so bad, the Bible says he disguised himself. He dressed up like somebody else and went out to fight this guy. What happened? He lost his life. It's an amazing thing, though, when you read the passage of Josiah, you realize that he had some other boys, and they became kings of Judah. You ever read about those guys? Jeconiah, Jehoiakim. They were wicked kings. I often thought about how much Josiah was so focused on the flesh and so focused on maybe, you know, we're going to do all these great things. We're going to defeat all these Egyptians. We're going to kill all these people. We're going to do all this stuff. And he forgot about his kids. Maybe he had a bigger battle at home than he had on the battlefield. He didn't even realize it. I wonder if the devil could get us off track and get us focused on some battle that's really not our battle. Kind of like I mentioned Wednesday night, you have to choose your hill to die on. And you've got to choose what's important. And Father's Day is coming up. You fathers and you mothers in here, you have a home and you have a family. And God set up that home and family and that social order before he even set up the church. You have a responsibility to those kids. I wonder if we don't get so engaged in fighting these battles way out here. I know of preachers and missionaries that have went out to try to save the world, and they've lost their own families in the process. The enemy is concealed, but thank God in verse 12, he's revealed. Folks, we're dealing with a spiritual wickedness in high places. And we're dealing with an evil that can't be stopped until Jesus Christ comes back. Now, if you know your Bible, you know Bible prophecy, so therefore lift up your heads. It's going to be all right. Just get excited as it gets a little more tense in America. As America begins to crumble, and I'm sure it is, at least as far as I read in the Bible, I don't see a great power in this country or in this world over here. So that means we're just getting closer and closer. So what a crazy way to view things. No, what a Christian way to view things. This world is my, not my home anyway. I like comfort just like everybody else. 
But we have to realize you're not going to change prophecy. There's a world getting everything set up for a man to show up on the scene with all the answers. Where he's going to come in, the Bible says, peaceably, and he'll attain the kingdom by flatteries. There'll be ten main kingdoms that will join in allegiance to this guy. The people of the east will not. The Bible says the men of the east are going to fight against him. You know who that is. And so it's interesting when you begin to think about these things and you say, well, what am I really fighting for? We need to be fighting for what God's wanting us to fight for. We have our own personal battles as Christians. Spiritual warfare. Don't get entangled. and Don't become imprudent. imprudent. And finally, look in Ephesians 6 again. Notice verses 13 to 18. We not only wrestle, we not only war, but we are to withstand. Verse number 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore. Now, if you back up to verse 11, he mentions the word stand. Then he says in verse 13, withstand, having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand. I get the idea he wants us to stand. Now, what are y'all sitting for? <laughs> One day I'm going to sit down and preach a message and have all y'all stand during it. Amen? When you read the Old Testament, Nehemiah stand, uh, get, opens up the Bible, all the people stand up. And he reads the whole time he's reading, everybody stands up. I guess the whole time he's, the, uh, this Ezra, rather, that uh, opens up the book. And uh, the whole time everybody's standing up. But the idea, the admonition is for us to stand. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. As the old saying goes. The world has a position and it's ever changing toward Satan's agenda. And when you look at not just our culture in America, but when you look at world culture, this thing's been breaking down a long time. Especially right at the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, it really began to break down. If you can do away with God, then obviously you take those steps. And that's exactly what society and culture has done. And so we have this culture that now is pushing perversion to be accepted. It's pushing tolerance for everything except a Bible-believing Christian. But here's my thing. If there is no God, where do you get your basis for what's good? If you think it's morally wrong to kill chickens, which I don't because I like to eat chickens. You say, why do you eat chickens? Because I'm higher up on the food chain. No, I'm not a Darwinian evolutionist. I eat chickens because they taste good fried. And God told us we could eat it. We need to tell our vegetarian friends that God killed the first animal in the Bible because of the vegetarian's sin. I'm sure that'd make him excited and happy. But he did. Adam and Eve sinned, and so God took an innocent lamb, and he killed the animal, and he clothed Adam and Eve, so that blood had to be shed. Of course, you know, it's about 1,600 years before men actually eat flesh and blood because of after the flood, God gives them permission to do that. In the New Testament, he said, every creature of God is good. But just taking that as an example, the world begins to push a certain moral or a, person or, or a certain agenda, or they set up a proposition of truth that you have to accept, or they push you to accept. Well, when it goes against the Bible, we just can't accept those positions. Uh, error is still error. It's not true. You can't accept it. We have to hold our position. The Bible still hasn't changed. You say, how do you do this? Well, verse number 10, I believe we have to stand in God's power. That thing keeps coming up again. It was there in Timothy. It's here in Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. He doesn't tell you to pick yourself up by your bootstraps, to encourage yourself, although the Bible does say David encouraged himself, right? You've got to read the rest of the verse. David encouraged himself and the Lord his God. Yeah. To be renewed in the spirit of your mind says, you know what? 
I'm going to stand up for what the Bible says even though the world's going against it. I'm going to stand up for what the Bible says even though people that I know are going against it. I'm going to stand up for God because I have the Bible behind me and I have God behind me. It's based on His power, not my power. The second thing you'll see in the text is the shielding of God's protection. Notice he goes through the pieces of armor, verses 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And by the way, verse 13, we should wear the whole armor. Some of you are walking around half-dressed. That's embarrassing. You know, you're walking around without your shield, walking around without your sword. Imagine these Christians that have these new versions. They're walking around with butter knives. You know, they have these weak versions, you know. You imagine having a Bible version that did not have the word hell in the New Testament. How are you going to tell somebody about heaven and hell and life after death when the word doesn't even appear in your, in your Bible? Or if it does, it only appears a couple of times. Walking around with a butter knife. You need to walk around with the sword, the word of God. You need to walk around with the shield of faith or the helmet of salvation. You need to walk around with your loins girt about with truth. Okay? There's a lot to that. It's not just, and I wish Brother Dale was uh, in his, in his uh, fatigues or whatever you call him, his uniform, because you'll see in law enforcement, they not only have their belt to hold the britches up, and thank God they do that, <laughs> but they've got the belt that's got all their stuff on it, man. It's got all their, their handcuffs and their gun, their taser, and all their cool stuff. And that belt, that's holding all the stuff. They have to have that. But you think about that belt of truth, it's not just the Bible. And thank God we've got the Bible, but the Bible makes reference to the piece of armor as being the Scripture is the, is the sword. So when it talks about truth, it has to do with not just Bible truth, not just the truth from providence, but personal truth. You've got to be honest. You've got to be willing to face yourself and look at yourself as you put those pieces on and realize, okay, I hadn't been holding up the shield of faith very much. What about the greaves of prayer in verse number 18? That's the only piece that's not mentioned, so it must be in verse 18, that first century Roman soldier, they had that part that went around like shin guards. And so when somebody prays, most of the time they kneel. And um, when somebody kneels, it's an act of worship, by the way. And so when they kneel down and pray, that having those greaves on, that is a type picture in verse number 18 of prayer. So you need to have all pieces of the armor. We're shielded by God's protection. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have a mission, and the mission is not to spread propaganda. It's to spread peace. You say, what kind of peace? You know, like they always say, you know, what's your number one goal in life? World peace. There's only going to be world peace when Jesus Christ comes back with armed warfare and makes world peace. And you read about that in Revelation chapter 19. He's called the Prince of Peace. You say, how does he do it? He does it by World War III or World War IV, if you want to divide up some of the other battles in the book of Revelation. He does it by armed warfare. And he's going to set this world up and then there will be peace. But we have the gospel of peace, which is in the midst of turmoil, a, a, a person can have the peace of God. They can know that their sins are forgiven. They can know that heaven's their home. They can know what the scripture says. They can read the Bible and start have their eyes opened. And they can have discernment. And they can look at a situation and they can take some examples from Scripture and they can apply it and they can make the right assessment. Thank God we have the gospel of peace. But we're strengthened, verse number 18, by God's presence in prayer. Finally, one more place. I told you finally, but one more, one more turn and we'll be done. 2 Timothy 4. I mentioned this in our introductory remarks. Paul the Apostle makes this statement before he dies. 2 Timothy is his last letter, and this is what he writes before he dies, before he's martyred. He makes a statement here in verse number 6. For, now, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. 
I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. We war, we wrestle, we withstand, we wait. We wait. The danger is that we get impatient. The danger is that we think he's not coming back. So well, I've heard it all my life. Grandma used to always talk about Jesus is coming back. And her grandmama talked about it. Well, they've been talking about it since the first century. Paul the apostle was looking for Jesus in his day. He thought he was going to be in that number that was not going to sleep, but going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. Paul, you went to sleep. I hope I'm going to be in that number that's not going to sleep and going to be caught up together. But we don't know. We have to patiently wait, like the verse says on the back wall in the book of James. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It's getting closer. You know, we are closer today than we were yesterday. We are closer right now than we were when we started the message. You might get out and start your car and you hear this, you think your engine's blowing up and it's the trumpet going off. Amen. And whoop, you just go right out through the sunroof. You say, I didn't know I had a sunroof. No, you won't need one. <laughs> Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall come and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about our hope. He says, we're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Just wait for it. That day is going to come. And when that day comes, it is going to be the day to end all days. So we just wait. You say, I'm a little impatient. I know I am too. The timing is his, the trials are ours to endure, to go through for him. Paul said, I fought a good fight. You know, when the Lord comes back and we go up, our days of work and service for Christ are done. There's nothing else you can do for Jesus Christ. You can't endure another trial. You can't go through another tribulation and take it in the right way. You can't live your life to please Jesus Christ on this earth anymore. It's done. Heaven's the place for rest. Earth is the place for work. This is the place that we toil. We are to see each day as a privilege and an opportunity. We are to love life. The Bible tells us that. We're, we're to enjoy our days, and we are to live our days for Him. Because one day the Lord's going to come. It's going to be done. It's in His timing. But as we wait, there's going to be some trials. There's going to be some testings. It's a pretty weak faith if we only have faith when things are going good. General Dwight Eisenhower said, there's no victory at discount prices. If we are the church that goes up at the rapture, which I hope we are, I hope he comes in our lifetime, we very well may see some judgments and some trials. And we are on a, we're on a battlefield. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, how are we doing on the battlefield? And are we aware that there are some dangers out there? Sometimes we just get to coasting along, and life maybe has been so easy that we don't realize or see the dangers. You ever been caught off guard? You ever been sucker punched? And those of you maybe in martial arts, whatever, there's nothing like getting hit when you're not expecting it. You ever been, I've, I've been knocked out several times. Anybody ever been knocked out? It's, it's nothing like it. You wake up and wonder what happened three hours ago or whatever. No, it's not that long, but it doesn't normally take long to wake back up. But you begin to see the stars and then you're gone. You ever pass out from exhaustion? You ever get sucker punched? Breath's gone out of you? You just, you didn't see it coming. And a lot of times the Christian life is that way. You're on the battlefield, you're wrestling, you're warring, and you don't realize the other angle. We started out 2020, I never would have thought halfway through the year this is what we would be dealing with in our culture and in our world. Who, who saw this coming? 
All these people that use these, these psychics, you know, on the side of the road, live in these little dumpy houses. You think, man, how come they can't, you know, win the lottery a couple of times? Kind of like the girl, you know, she, uh, she broke it off with her boyfriend. Well, she felt real bad. She wrote him a letter back in the days when people did that. <laughs> she wrote a letter and just told him how sorry she was, and she just kept apologizing. It was wrong. It was foolish of me. You were really the one for me. I love you. Please take me back. Please take me back. P.S. Congratulations on winning the lottery. <laughs> How come these psychics can't just win the lottery? They, didn't, they don't see it coming. It's all a scam. Nobody saw it coming. And you go through trials and troubles in your life, and some of you younger folks in here, you don't know what this world's got for you. You think things, you got it all planned out. You think it's going to go this way. Maybe you've been able to make, and I'm not saying don't make preparation and don't plan certain things, certainly. But you make these little plans, and then... It doesn't turn out that way. Say, so what is that? That's life. And as Christians, we've got to be able to recognize these dangers on the battlefield because the devil wants to use those little things to knock you out of the race, to defeat you, to destroy you, to entangle you, to get you focused on the wrong thing. Are you fighting for Christ? Are you on the battlefield? There's a, there's a war if you're not raging that war, you need to get in the battle. There's a war on, on the inside. There's a war taking place. That flesh wants to do what it wants to do. The spirit wants to do what Jesus wants to do. And every day you're wrestling, you're warring. The world's trying to push its agenda on you. Christianity now is trying to push that stuff because I'm telling you for years in the name of getting the gospel out. Evangelical churches have compromised biblical standards in the name of trying to get the world in the church, and now they, are just, they just keep crossing the line and crossing the line, and the evangelical church is crossing those lines. If you're not going to stand now, you're not going to stand when it gets worse. So we have to realize there's some dangers on the battlefield and ask for God's help. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you that we can...